Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about the cerebrum and the cerebral cortex. And if you do like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out ninjanerd.org. All of our notes and illustrations are there for you guys and also our merchandise. Now, let's get started with our central nervous system video talking about the cerebrum and then the cerebral cortex. So, you might be wondering, why are we talking about both? Well, the cerebrum here, that's our largest portion of our brain, right? It's where we have all of our higher functioning. And it's located here in this whole blue shaded area. It can then be broken into our left and right hemisphere. So if we're looking down on the brain here, we have the anterior portion here, posterior here. When we look down, we can have our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere. And down the middle of the brain, it's divided by our longitudinal fissure. So then when we talk about our cerebrum, we can talk about our cerebral cortex. Why are they kind of the same? Well, the cerebral cortex is the two to five millimeter layer outside or around the cerebrum. It is our area where we have very, very dense amount of cell bodies. So let's back it up again. Our cerebral cortex is our gray matter that's on the surface of our cerebrum. Well, why is it gray matter? In our nervous system, right, we have neurons. We have a neuron right here. In our neuron, let's identify some structures in it really quick. We have our dendrites, our nucleus, our cell body, our axon, and our axon terminals. And when we look at a neuron, we also have these areas right here, which are our myelin sheaths. And they play an important role in the sending and signaling. So if we think about the cerebral cortex is our gray matter. And in our cerebral cortex is a lot of cell bodies. And if we draw this line here, we essentially have this area of a neuron that's really condensed in our gray matter. And we have this area with the myelin sheath that is in our white matter, right? That's gonna allow our signals to be sent. And what's cool about the myelin sheath, if you picture the axon like a long superhighway, you picture these myelin sheaths as like these little boosters, right? So they're gonna help send these signals a lot quicker, a lot faster. So if you take a cross section of the brain and we look at it here, we have our gray matter here. And we have our white matter, this area here. We are able to understand that the cerebral cortex is this gray area all around the cerebrum here, right? So that layer, like I said before, it's about two to five millimeters thick and it's surrounding the total aspect here. What's really neat about that is the gray matter that is our cerebral cortex has all these lumps, bumps, grooves, folds on it. And why is that? Why does this have all of this lumps and bumps? It has to do with the increase in surface area. This increase in surface area is allowing there to be more dense buildup of all these different cell bodies, making it gray matter. And that gray matter is going to allow us to send more efficient and lots more signals and having those neurons firing in order for us to get that high level of functioning. And we said the brain has all these lumps, bumps, grooves, but what are they? So we took a picture here, we kind of zoomed in on this layer here, and what you can see is our gray matter, our white matter, and if you took for a, section, a second to picture, a neuron within this, you could think right here would be our neuron, right, our cell body with our nucleus, our dendrites, coming down with our axon and our axon terminal, and then our myelin sheath. That's kind of how they're laying in there, right? Well, within all these lumps, bumps, and grooves, we have names for them. So real quickly, let's identify this right here is our bump that's coming out is our gyrus or if there's lots of them, gyri. This little valley here is called a sulcus. And then if there's many of them, it's a sulci. And then we have this bigger one here, which is called a fissure. Now you may notice that sometimes within anatomy, we may have an interchange here between sulcus and fissure, but just don't interchange gyrus with anything. Gyrus is always our bump up. Sulci is a divot. Fissure is an even deeper type of divot. So now, we can look at this lateral view of the brain here, right, with our anterior portion here, posterior portion here, so we're looking at the left hemisphere. We can quickly identify these different types of fissures or sulci that are able then to tell us which lobes we are looking at within the brain. 
So let's identify quickly what different lobes we have. We have our frontal, so we're going to just put F, our parietal, our occipital, and then our temporal. And as we look at this diagram of the brain, we have different delineations between the different lobes. So we're going to identify them really quickly. This one right here that's dividing our frontal to parietal is called our central sulcus. Then we have a break here between our frontal and our temporal, and that's called our lateral fissure, also being called the sylvian fissure. And then we can go back here, we have one of the easiest ones I think to name, because we have our parietal lobe and our occipital. So this is the parieto-occipital sulcus. And then we have one right here that is separating our cerebrum, mostly our occipital and temporal lobe, from our cerebellum. And that's a transverse fissure. So now that we understand a little bit of what we're looking at here with all these different delineations between the lobes, let's jump over and talk about each individual lobe and their function. Now let's break down the four different lobes of the cerebral cortex. And mainly we're going to talk about these four. Your class may talk about a couple others, like our limbic or insula, but we're going to hit on the first four right here. I'll have separate videos for insula and limbic. So when we talk about frontal, we're going to focus on this portion of the brain, right? So we're looking at the brain in a lateral view, where this is the anterior portion, posterior portion, right? So we're looking at the left hemisphere here. And we can locate really quickly on the brain the central sulcus. And when we talked about before where we have sulci, we also have gyri, right, or gyrus, or bumps. So if this is something that's pushed in, right, it's a little valley, we have these two bumps on either side of it. If we're looking anterior to the sulcus, we're looking at this gyrus. And this gyrus is called the precentral gyrus. And the one that's behind it is called the postcentral gyrus. And the reason I'm pointing those out is because within our brain we have anatomical structures that also have a cortex or a, a job that they need to do that we're going to identify. So it makes it a lot easier to understand some of the names. So as we look at the frontal lobe and we're looking at this portion right here in blue, we're going to identify four different structures. So right here we have something that is called a primary. And within the brain and within the lobes we have primary areas and we have association areas. Primary areas are going to be having one job where association is going to have another job. But overall with our frontal lobe, we have our motor cortex. So within the lobe, within this area, this precentral gyrus, we have an area that's called our primary motor cortex. So our primary motor cortex right here has a job. What is the job of our primary motor cortex? It is to help us get our movement, specifically our voluntary movement. So in front of this we have our motor association cortex. Our motor association cortex is our area of planning of movement, right? So this is the area that's going to help us plan, to kind of figure out what we want to do, and then we're going to be able to have that signal to move, right? Even more anterior to our motor association is our prefrontal cortex. Within this area, you're going to find personality, you're going to find some memory. And then our last area here that is delineated in these dotted lines, you're going to notice two of them. They're on there purposely because these areas are predominantly in the dominant hemisphere of the individual that you're looking at. So whatever brain that you're looking at on an individual, Dominant hemisphere, meaning if they're right-handed, typically their left hemisphere is their dominant hemisphere. Vice versa, if they're left-handed, it would be their right. Okay, so that's why it's drawn there in a dotted line, because sometimes it's not located in the left hemisphere, but it's located in the right. But the general area for most population, it's right in this area, so number four, and it's called our Broca's area. And our Broca's area plays an important role in our speech production. So as we look at our frontal cortex, what we can see here, its primary focus or biggest job that the frontal cortex or the frontal lobe does is motor, right? So it's going to think about movement. As we move through the next lobe and we talk about temporal lobe, right, which is an area that's basically right here, 
it's kind of going to give away to you a little bit of what the job is of the temporal lobe. So right here on the temporal, we have it broken into three different areas. The first area right here is known as our primary auditory cortex. And our primary auditory cortex is auditory, meaning whenever we have sounds come in, we're going to be able to hear the sound, right, and be able to at least hear pitch. The primary auditory cortex is also going to be able to delineate location of sound. Now our primary auditory cortex is able to locate the sound and receive the sound, hear the pitch, but it's not going to be able to identify the sound. The job of identifying a sound comes from our auditory association cortex, which is right here, number six. And then you're going to notice over here we have a dotted line area, like I said before about brocas. This is another area that will be on the dominant hemisphere of the individual. But this area right here is our Wernicke's area. So where our Broca's area was mostly focusing on speech production, utilizing the muscles to the motor to speak, right, and have words come out of our mouths, Wernicke's is more about the comprehension of written and auditory language. So if you think about this, if you ever get them confused, think about where they are. The Broca's area is in the front, and it has to do with the motor cortex, right? So you can think about that's how we're going to speak, right? How we're going to move our mouth to make language. Where our temporal is near our ear and has to do with us being able to hear and listen or read, right, language. Which is why it's also kind of overlapping in other areas, which makes sense in a minute. Now we're going to hop over here to our parietal lobe. When we look at our parietal lobe, we talked about this before. There's the central sulcus with the postcentral gyrus. And within the postcentral gyrus is where we have our first cortex for the parietal lobe, and that is called our primary somatosensory cortex. And our primary somatosensory, you hear the word somatosensory, it's got to do with our ability to feel, right? And what we are looking at here with somatosensory is we're looking at fine touch, we're looking at the ability to feel different things. Okay, but we're not going to recognize them with our brain, but it is the ability for our brain to take in that information. So this would be things like temperature, pressure, being able to feel the different types of texture. But then behind it, if you remember by now, is going to be our association cortex. So number nine right here is going to be our somatosensory association cortex. And what is the job of the somatosensory cortex? This is the one that's going to be able to tell us and recognize what we're feeling, right? So if we had our eyes closed or we were doing uh, one of my favorite things to watch is the people that put things in a box and try to guess what they are without being able to see it, we're going to be able to recall certain things that we may have experienced within our life. Is this something soft? Does this feel like a cat? Does this feel like a soft blanket? Does this feel sharp, like I shouldn't be touching it? Is it hot? Is it cold? The difference between burning your hand on a hot pan versus holding a nice, warm, like hot cocoa mug. And then our last lobe that we have to talk about right here is our occipital. We have two areas to talk about, one here and one here. So with occipital, this is where we're going to have all of our visual, right? We're going to be able to have our vision, be able to see. So within this, we have two areas. And if it's already, we already know it's our occipital, it has to do with our vision taken in. The first area is right here. What do you think we're calling that? This is our primary visual cortex. And what is our job of our primary visual cortex is to bring in all of that information, right? What we're going to be able to see, but we're we are not going to be able to identify necessarily. So we're going to bring in that information, but we're not going to identify. The area that's going to take care of that identification is going to be this area right here, which is our visual association cortex. And then this is the area that's going to help us identify what we're seeing. Are we seeing shapes, colors? Are we seeing someone's face that we've seen before? All of that is going to be identified with our association cortex.
All right, Ninja Nerds, that is the video on cerebral cortex and the cerebrum. I hope it made sense. I hope you learned something from this. Make sure you stick around for more central nervous and the neurosystem videos. And as always, until next time. Thank you.